All right, so uh, we finally get to water waves, which is almost certainly the first thing that we all think about when the word wave is first mentioned. Um, and we had to wait this long because water waves are in fact much more complicated than both the simple vibrations of oscillators or strings that we talked about earlier in this chapter, um, or also more complicated than the waves of, say, sound propagating through a fluid. Um, so to get us started, let me first draw a picture of kind of the anatomy of a water wave. So um, let's say I've got like a crest and a trough and a crest, uh, and this is a wave that's kind of going to be traveling in this direction. Okay. So there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of features in the anatomy of one of these traveling waves on the surface of uh, some water uh, that shares uh, features with what we've already discussed. Right? So there's a wavelength for these waves, that is the distance from one crest to the next crest. Um, or we might say that you know, this distance from uh, the trough of one wave to the crest of the next is half of a wavelength. Uh, and this whole distance from crest to crest would be one full wavelength. Right? And these waves are traveling at some speed in some direction, so there's a wave speed, a wave velocity associated with their motion. That means that if we you know, are standing in place and letting these waves go over us, there'll be a frequency with which these crests of water sweep past us. So there's wavelengths, there's speeds, there's velocities. Um, now, you might wonder, how is the actual water itself moving? When the wave passes over the surface of the water, it's actually not taking huge amounts of water with it. Um, instead, uh, the actual water is kind of moving in these little circles. So at the peak of a crest, uh, water will be moving kind of forward just a little bit. Um, at the trough, uh, water is kind of moving backwards just a little bit. And in between uh, is kind of in between. So if you are watching, say, a little you know, floating bird here, uh, of course, I don't know how to draw a bird. Uh, and if you watch that bird kind of as it stays in place, it will trace out a little circular motion. And these circles in the water um, kind of get smaller and smaller as you go deeper and deeper before they kind of peter out by the time you get to a depth of water, which is itself the same as about half of the wavelength of the wave. Right? So the motions of little molecules of water in these circles is biggest right at the surface. Um, and by the time you get this half wavelength distance deep into the water, um, basically uh, the water is motionless. The water is motionless. Okay. So that's kind of the basic anatomy of a wave traveling across the surface uh, of the water. Um, something that's very different about these waves compared to the sorts of waves we talked about earlier is that uh, for water waves, for water waves, um, the wave speed speed depends on depends on um, wavelength. So remember. Earlier, when we were talking about um, the speed of sound, we said the wave speed was equal to the wavelength times the frequency, but that the speed of sound in any substance was a constant number. And so if you change the frequency, you had to also change the wavelength. Well, here, the speed of a wave is something that changes, um, and it changes in a way that depends on the wavelength of, um, of whatever wave we're thinking about. Uh, whatever wave we're thinking about. Uh, OK. so. Let me uh, get started uh, by kind of pointing out that there are many different types of waves, many different types types of water waves, and that's one of the things that makes water waves so much more complicated. Um, so much more complicated. So first, uh, I'll spend the rest of this uh, section kind of tracing out some of the most important different types of water waves, and the first of these in section ten point three point one are uh, capillary waves or capillary waves. I've never known how to say this. Capillary waves um, are like the little ripples that you'll see on the surface of the water all the time. If you go to a calm lake and you see like a very light breeze blowing across it and making little, you know, very small ripples, those are capillary waves. Or if you have a cup of coffee or something and you, you know, drip a drop of water into it, you'll see these tiny capillary ripples um, flowing outwards from wherever you dropped that drop. Right? Uh, or if you are skipping a stone lightly across the surface of a, a lake or a river or something, you'll see these little capillary ripples. So these capillary waves um, are due to surface tension. Oh, 
right? So that is to say, you know, when you have a container of water, you know, at rest, the surface of that water wants to be as flat as possible. Um, but water still has a certain ability to kind of stick to other drops of water. And that's why you can actually like overfill your glass of water by a little bit so that there's like this small dome of water that will stay in the glass uh, and not spilling out because there's a certain surface tension, um, uh, a certain adhesiveness of the water molecules to each other. What that means in the context of waves is that if you have very small waves, uh, you know, perturbing the surface of the water away from kind of the natural level of the water, um, the surface tension of the interface between the water and the air wants this to be flat. And this, you know, kind of wave bump is making it less than flat. So there will be a restoring force from surface tension that wants to pull, uh, that wants to restore the waves to this kind of flat equilibrium uh, position. Okay. So surface tension is acting as a restoring force. Um, and it's kind of another way of saying that from the perspective of like its potential energy, water wants to stay as flat as possible. Okay. Um, just like every other type of wave that we've mentioned so far, capillary waves can combine and overlap, add together, so on and so forth. So uh, this will be, I guess, a time I could have put this at any point in the chapter, where I'll talk very briefly about wave interference. which is the idea that um, different waves, different waves, uh, can add together. Uh, and I apologize while I just uh, pull up some animations that I accidentally closed. Uh, so different waves can add together. So for instance, um, if you have two waves that are the same and you add them together, you will get a wave which has a crest which is twice as high and a dip which is twice as low, right? Similarly, if you take a wave and add it to its opposite, so instead of a wave that goes kind of up and down like so, and you add these together, the peaks here will cancel each other out. Uh, the peak and the trough will cancel out. And here, the trough and the peak will cancel out. And you'll just get a flat line. So this case is called uh, constructive interference. In uh, this case over here is called destructive interference. And the idea here is that you can literally just add the shapes of these waves together um, to find out what the shape of the combined wave is going to look like. It's called the superposition uh, of waves. Okay. Superposition of waves. And so uh, let's see if this uh, has finished generating. Not quite yet. You can see we've got some nice uh, oscillations going. Uh, this example is actually one such version of superposition. Here, what I'm doing is taking the sum of these two fundamental oscillation modes of a of a string. So here I have the fundamental mode, which is just you know the string oscillating back and forth, as we saw in a previous lecture. Um, here I'm taking the second harmonic, which has half as long a wavelength and has a frequency which is twice as big. And if you add those two shapes together, you get um, this pattern of motion. Right. So this is the case when you're adding two waves that aren't traveling anywhere together. You just kind of directly add them on top of each other. and uh, maybe when it finishes in just a moment, I'll come back to this um, come back to this animation when it finishes generating to show what happens in the same way when two waves that are actually traveling through space or traveling along the surface of the water uh, encounter and meet each other. Okay. Um, <clears throat> great. But so these are these are capillary waves, and um, a defining feature of capillary waves. of capillary waves, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is that um, their wavelength is pretty small. Their wavelength is going to be something on the order of a few centimeters. Right? So these uh, tiny little ripples, which can be controlled by surface tension, um, are very small waves. They're just these small little uh, disturbances of water. And capillary forces or surface tension are the dominant things that act as the restoring force in this case. 
acted as a storming force in this case. Um, on the other hand, the the much bigger um, kind of waves that you might see if you go down to the ocean um, are governed with a restoring force that comes not from surface tension, but from gravity. It's called gravity waves, right? And so here, again, the idea is maybe you have, you know, a long wavelength, a longer amount of water uh, in a wavelength displaced away from its equilibrium position. And now, energetically, the thing that wants to restore this to a flat shape is gravitational potential energy of the water, right? Water wants to seek its own level, as we kind of saw in the chapter on fluids. You know, it wants to, it doesn't want to have, you know, some water at a higher potential energy up here and some water at a lower potential energy over here. It wants to equalize everything. And so when the wavelengths of these waves on the surface of water get sufficiently long, uh, gravity rather than surface tension becomes the most important uh, feature. So as the slightly, say, stronger winds uh, sweep over the ocean, um, we get these kind of gravity waves uh, generated in response. So the wavelengths of these gravity waves, wavelengths for gravity waves, rather than being uh, centimeters, can be, say, 60 meters to 600 meters, right? Really a lot longer. Now, you might notice that there's like a gap in between these two regimes. Like if gravity waves might be 60 meters and capillary waves might be, you know, centimeters, uh, isn't there a big gap between a few centimeters and 60 meters? Of course there is. Um, and this is one of those complications of waves on the surface of water. In between capillary waves and gravity waves are waves that are governed by simultaneously both surface tension and gravity. And they're a little bit more complicated to, uh, to describe, and so we won't, we won't worry about them for the time being. Okay. Um, so instead, we'll just keep things um, somewhat simpler and have this division into Okay, these little rippling capillary waves, and then these longer uh, gravity waves. Okay, so uh, for these waves, the frequency with which the crests will move past any particular point is determined by the forces that are generating the waves in the first place. And so the speed of the wave um, depends on that frequency, or equivalently depends on that uh, period. So um, how fast? How fast do gravity waves move? waves move. Uh, the formula for the speed of a gravity wave, uh, I'm going to write it in two different ways. On the one hand, we could write it, if we like, as the square root of the acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second squared, or something like that, multiplied by the wavelength of these gravity waves, so something between 60 and 600 meters, um, and then divided by 2 pi. You could have figured out that it was something like the square root of g times lambda just by dimensional analysis, kind of like we talked about for oscillators in the first section of this chapter. And then there's this square root of 1 over 2 pi as like the numerical factors that make this an actual equation. OK, so the wave speed depends on the square root of the wavelength for these uh, gravity waves. I can also write this expression in terms of the period of the gravity waves. So how long does it take if I'm standing still for one crest and then the following crest to actually move past me. And that's given by the product of the acceleration due to gravity times the period of these um, cycles divided by 2 pi. Once again, you can tell just from dimensional analysis, you know, meters per second squared um, times seconds gives me something that is meters per second or a uh, speed. Right? So you can tell from dimensional analysis that it had to be something like this. Um, and then the 2 pi is just some number that we stick around because uh, it finishes making it inequality. Right? Uh, if you like, you can also uh, use this part of these two equations as a way of relating for these waves uh, in deep water. And I might have forgotten to say this. Deep water wave speed. Um, you can see a relationship between the wavelength and the period for these um, deep water waves. Uh, and so just to give you some, you know, actual uh, numbers here, you know, if you say, uh, pick a wavelength, which is like, uh, that might be where the camera is, let me move it down a little bit. Uh, if you pick a wavelength, which is something like 200 meters, um, 200 meters, then this formula would tell you that the wave speed is something like um, 18 meters per second, give or take, right? Pretty, you know, substantially fast at some at some level, comparable to like, human sprinting or something like that. Um, now, 
what do I mean when I say the wave speed um, is the wave speed in deep water? Well, I need to go back up to this like anatomy of a wave to kind of explain. When a wave passes over the surface of the water, it's actually disturbing water down to some depth, down to a depth which is equal to about half of its own wavelength. Right? So as long as there's more than that much water underneath the surface, then the equation that we just saw gives you the speed of a wave. Right? And that's what we mean by deep water waves, waves which are on water, which is deeper than half of the wave's own wavelength. Right? On the other hand, you know, if there's like a ocean floor or something, or you know, you're approaching the beach or something, um, then you don't have time to kind of finish all of these tiny little circles of water, and the speed is not the same. It goes from being a deep water wave to a shallow water wave. Um, so uh, let's say, so deep water depth greater than, let's say, wavelength divided by two, you get this. In shallow water, and by shallow water here, I'm going to mean something like depth less than about the wavelength divided by 20. Um, in shallow water, the, the speed of the wave stops depending on its own wavelength, and it depends only on the depth of the water itself. So in shallow water, you have waves that move with the speed, which is basically just the acceleration due to gravity multiplied by the depth of the water. Right? Uh, and in between, so if you have water which is you know, uh, deeper than, uh, sorry, you have water which is deeper than uh, the wavelength divided by 20, but it's not in the like deep water regime of lambda over 2, um, it's more complicated, and there's a much more complicated mathematical expression that helps you understand how fast those waves travel. And it's kind of, kind of depends on both the wavelength and the depth at that case. Okay. Um, this kind of feature of gravity waves, which tell us that you know the speed with which water waves move, you know they move faster the longer their wavelength is, but the speed that they move depends on whether they're in deep water or shallow water has consequences for what waves look like when they get towards the shore. As waves approach the shore, the depth of the ocean, for instance, is getting less and less. And inevitably, the wavelength of the wave gets to be in this shallow water regime. So the details of what waves look like as they break onto the shore kind of depends on, well, how fast does the ocean floor um, rise up and become shallow? If it's a really gradual process, then waves tend to kind of just like fizzle and bubble out. Um, they kind of look like a sort of rolling boil in, in a way. Um, if the ocean floor is much more steeply, you know, going from deep to shallow, then uh, these wave crests, as you know, the speed with which they move forward kind of shifts from being dominated by the wave's own size to the depth of the water, these wave crests um, don't have time to kind of complete themselves, and they kind of fall over, the top half falls over the bottom half. And that gives you those kind of iconic surfing style waves um, when the ocean gets uh, less deep very quickly. Right. Okay. So one thing that I'll say before I leave this section on gravity waves is that uh, this range that I quoted here, something like 60 meters to 600 meters, is mostly true when um, the waves are generated by winds. Generated. Right. So you know, there's lots of winds all over the earth, and when there are, you know, moderate to strong winds blowing over large swaths of the ocean, you get gravity waves that have a wavelength in this kind of regime. But um, other things also generate gravity waves. So seismic gravity waves, seismic gravity waves, which occur when, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, you have the ocean, and maybe along one of the Earth's tectonic faults, faults, there's like a slipping event. And so suddenly this massive column of water gets like lifted up a little bit um, and then generates uh, an extremely long wavelength, powerful uh, wave. These seismic gravity waves can have a much longer wavelength, wavelengths that approach um, hundreds of kilometers. You know, there aren't really wind processes on Earth that are strong enough to generate waves on the surface of the ocean that are that crazy. Winds, you know, 
top out around several hundred meters in uh, wavelength. But seismically generated waves, the wavelengths can be enormous, you know, hundreds of kilometers. One of the things that's important there is, you know, if the wavelength is hundreds of kilometers, from the perspective of a seismically generated wave, like a tsunami, um, it's always in shallow water. Right? Like the typical depth, the typical depth of the ocean, like out in the middle of nowhere, uh, is maybe something like four kilometers deep, something like that. Um, four kilometers deep. So hundreds of kilometers divided by 20 is, you know, you're always in shallow water, right? So uh, that means, among other things, you know, the speed with which they travel uh, is basically just dependent on the depth of the ocean. And you plug in these numbers, you know, typical depth of the ocean and acceleration due to gravity, and you get tsunamis that can travel as fast as uh, airplanes. So tsunamis travel like jet planes across the ocean. Right? So these unbelievably, you know, powerful, potentially devastating waves are also traveling extremely fast, uh, propagating from wherever the seismic event that generated them was uh, outward. Right? Um, it's kind of, it's un unbelievable. Unbelievable. I want to close uh, this section by talking about actually another type of gravity wave, but um, something that we usually don't think about as waves, um, and that's the tides of the ocean, right? Something that I want to kind of mention, you know, uh, these seismically generated gravity waves, that's pretty big, you know, a wavelength of 100 kilometers, hundreds of kilometers, that's, you know, that's really quite impressive. Um, but actually, the largest water waves on the planet are the tides, and these span the entire globe, right? So here, uh, the wavelength for the tides is, you know, half of the Earth's circumference, as we'll see in just a second. So something like, not hundreds of kilometers, but 20,000 kilometers, right? 12,000 miles or something like that. Okay, so, uh, you know, these are a type of gravity wave which have as long a wavelength as possible on the Earth, essentially. Uh, so before I get ahead of myself, okay, what are the tides? You know, if you've never uh, lived by the ocean, um, uh, let me just quickly explain. You know, there's some natural level to the ocean. And if you watch where this level of the ocean hits the beach, you'll notice that it changes over time. So at some point, which we call high tide, uh, it's as high as it ever gets. And then six and a quarter hours later, it gets as low as it ever gets. Um, and then six and a quarter hours later, the water level rises back to high tide, and then low tide, and then high tide, and then low tide, back and forth. And so if you're building a sand castle, you know, over here, the tides are going to sweep over it, so you you have certain uh, limitations in what you can what you can actually get done. Now, this cycle is what the tides are: a gradual, overall rising and lowering of the level at which the ocean line, the ocean meets the shore. Say, so what causes the tides? What causes these? You know, lambda equals twenty thousand kilometer. Uh, period equals six point about six point two five hour uh, gravity waves. Mostly, it's the moon. The moon. Okay, so we learned earlier that the strength of the gravitational attraction between two objects depends on the distance between them. Right? But usually, for any one problem that we're working on, we think of the strength of gravity as being pretty constant. Right? So we use the same acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth, this lowercase g, and we know that if we're in different spots of the Earth, it varies a little bit, but we kind of always just pretend it's, you know, pretend it's g. Um, well, on some of these astronomical distance scales, that stops being the case. And we have to remember that you know, nothing here that I'm about to draw is to scale, by the way. Uh, if we have the moon over here, and we have the Earth over here, this side of the Earth is closer to the moon than this side of the Earth is, right? So things on this part of the Earth feel a stronger gravitational pull due to the moon than things on this side of the Earth do, okay? Now, in our everyday life, we don't really notice this because 
the difference between these uh, gravitational poles is not that big. Um, but water, the water covering the Earth's surface, you know, connected, uh, you know, at the, near the poles of the Earth anyway, all of the oceans of the Earth, um, can adapt its overall shape so that uh, the height of the water reflects the fact that there's a little bit stronger of a pole over on this side of the Earth than there is over on this side of the Earth. So you might have thought that, based on that explanation, there's like a little bulge of water sweeping out uh, from the Earth towards the Moon. Grossly exaggerated, obviously, right? But, you know, if water over here feels more of a pull, maybe it would look something like, you know, something like this. But that would not actually give you the tides that I've just described. As the Earth rotates around, any point on Earth, you know, as the Earth, say, spun this way, would encounter high tide once every you know, once every uh, day, rather than once every half day, right? Uh, so here, uh, I should have specified this is high to low. High to low, the actual period as we've been defining it as the distance between crests is something more like 12 and a half hours, right? It takes six hours to go from high to low, and then another six hours to go from low back to high, right? So if this was the picture we were going to draw, then we would see high tide once every about 24 hours rather than twice every 24 hours. So why is it that there are actually two high tides per day? It's the following. You know, if you want to think about it this way, you can. Water on this side of the Earth feels a attraction due to the moon's gravitational pull, which is bigger than the attraction felt by the center of the Earth, by a little bit, right? Just by some small amount because this point is closer to the moon than this point is. So water on this side of the Earth falls towards the moon a little bit faster than the center of the Earth falls towards the moon. By the same token, the center of the Earth feels uh, a gravitational attraction, an acceleration towards the moon, which is a little bit bigger than the acceleration felt by water on this side of the Earth. So actually, it's like the Earth, you know, relative to water over here, falls away from this water faster. You actually get these two bulges of water that, you know, as the Earth then rotates around, these bulges then rotate around uh, the surface of the Earth, sweep around the Earth. Agreed. <laughs> so, so because of this moon, the moon's gravitational pull, um, water over here falls towards it faster than the Earth does, and the Earth falls towards the moon faster than water over here does, giving us these two um, bulges of water. Great. Uh, Great. Now, I said mostly the moon uh, because the sun also contributes. The sun also contributes. You know, uh, the sun is, the sun is, on the one hand, much more massive than the moon, but it's also much farther away. much farther away. Um, and you'll remember that Newton's universal law of gravitation went like this gravitational constant times, say, the mass of one object, the mass of the other object, let's call the other object the Earth in this case, um, divided by the separation squared. So for the Sun, you know, m1, the mass of the Sun, is much bigger than the mass of the Moon, but the distance between the Sun and the Earth is much bigger than the distance between the Earth and the Moon. The net result, net result, um, is that the sun's tidal forces, the sun's tidal influences, are about half as big as the moon's. Half as big as the moon's. Right? And so uh, we can draw a little picture, or a sequence of little pictures, where I'm going to have uh, four copies of the sun at different times of the month. Maybe we'll call this day one, day seven, day 14, and day 21, for reasons that you'll see in a second. We've got the Earth. Again, nothing here being drawn to scale. And then the moon. So, you know, on day one of the month, and then halfway through the month, uh, the sun, the moon, and the Earth are all lined up with each other, right? And, you know, here on day 14, as I've drawn it, you would have a full moon. Uh, as the light of the sun, you know, hits the moon and reflects back to the Earth. Um, 
Here, uh, you would see a new moon, uh, right? Um, but things are all in line. Uh, and on the other parts of the month, day uh, seven and day 14, the moon's gonna be either at a right angle this way or a right angle this way. What does this kind of picture mean? Um, I guess I should have drawn the earth in green because I'm about to draw the water in blue. What does this kind of picture mean? Um, you know, here, as I've drawn it, the moon wants to make a tidal bulge and the sun wants to make a tidal bulge in the same direction. And so the tides are reinforced. You get a high tide, which is bigger than normal because the tidal force of the sun is lined up with the tidal force of the moon. Uh, these are called spring tides. And day 14, it has the same name, spring tides. Again, because these gravitational influences give you two bulges. It doesn't matter if it's sun, moon, earth, or sun, earth, moon. You have an enhancement of the tides in both cases. On the other hand, uh, on days 7 and 21, you can see that you know the moon's influence wants to make a bulge this way. The sun's influence wants to make a bulge in the other direction. Right Now, the tidal influence of the moon is stronger than the sun, so uh, the moon wins this particular fight. Um, but the magnitude of the tide is reduced a little bit. So in both day 7 and day 21, you get this competition between these two tidal influences, and you have kind of less extreme than expected uh, tides. And in English, these are called neap tides. And I have no idea where this word neap comes from. It could be anything. All right, but that is the tides. So the tides are basically these massive gravity waves whose wavelength is the wavelength of half the Earth, half the Earth's circumference, and their period is basically half a day. You know, it's not exactly half a day because the Earth rotates uh, once per day, uh, and the Moon revolves around the Earth once per lunar month. You know, so as the Earth is spinning like this, the Moon is, you know, revolving this way very slowly, and so um, the period is a little bit longer than than just half a day, than exactly half a day. But there you have it. You have these kind of three basic types of water waves. You have capillary waves, you have gravity waves that can exist either in deep water or in shallow water. And in deep water, that is like most waves out on the ocean generated by wind. For shallow water, that could be wind-generated waves approaching the shore. It could be seismic waves. Uh, it could be the tides.